Hello everyone, uh, my name is Nicola, I'm a program manager at Waymo, and today I will be talking about Porter's Five Forces. Uh, five Forces are a framework defined by Michael Porter in the 80s that is aimed to help you uh, analyze and look at a specific market uh, and identify what are the key factors that regulate profitability and competition. And there are five forces and we're going to look into them, uh, find some examples and then try to apply to a specific case study. Uh, so let's dive in. Uh, the first force uh, that we're going to look at is the threats of new entrants, which basically helps you understand how easy or difficult it is for new competitors to enter an industry and begin offering uh, a product or a service to consumers. Uh, so when you think about it, uh, the key factors here are like the capital requirements, the learning curve. So how expensive is to get into enter this industry? How hard and how much do I need to learn before I'm able to get in? Uh, what are the legal barriers? Uh, are there like any specific economy of scale that I need to be concerned of? Uh, how important is the brand and so on? And the reason here that we look at this specific factor is that uh, the lower the barrier, the more competitors will, the more player might enter a specific sector. And so the more competitive the specific sector becomes and the risk of uh, commoditize your product, which will eventually erode your margins and profits. So some example here, uh, the airplane manufacturing industry, uh, so Boeing or Airbus, for example, has very high capital requirements, a uh, very steep learning curve, uh, legal bar into getting a regulatory approval, which makes it fairly hard for new players to get in. And that's why the, the sector is actually an oligop oligopoly and has very low threats of new androids. On the opposite side, if we take like coffee shops, uh, you know, very low capital requirements compared to Boeing, of course. Uh, easy of learn uh, in learning the, squeal, the skills and how much it might take you to learn those. Uh, the product differentiation is fairly low, like low brand uh, loyalty as well. Whether it's Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, a local coffee shop. Uh, this makes the sector uh, very easy for players to get in. Uh, has like fairly high um, threats of new entrants and low barrier of entry. Uh, when we move to our second force, then uh, we have supplier bargaining. We'll see supplier bargaining power and uh, buyer bargaining power. They're the same type of uh, concept, but on different uh, sides. On the supplier side, the idea is to see how much influence on cost, availability and quality of inputs a specific supplier might have on the player operating in this industry. So the key factor that we want to look here is like how important volume is to supplier how much pull through there is from end customers, and we'll see what it means. Whether there is a threat of forward integration, so whether there is a risk of the supplier to actually forward integrate and enter the specific sector we're looking at. The switching cost uh, from one supplier to another, availability of substitute, and so on. And you know, the bigger the supplier uh, leverage they might have on, on a specific sector, the higher the risk that you're gonna soon uh, little by little lose your margins on your profit and they're going to move through the suppliers uh, side. Uh, some example here, uh, you know, in the aerospace industry, Rolls-Royce have a very strong uh, bargaining power over the manufacturer. Uh, that's why there is a uh, low availability of substitutes. Not that many other companies provide the same product or Rolls-Royce do for um, aviation. High differentiation and high switching cost is very hard for Boeing to switch from Rolls-Royce to another uh, provider uh, without having to reimagine a lot of their uh, supply chain and also like high legal barrier to get regulatory approval uh, which makes them uh, fairly strong uh, in um, being the one supplier that is kind of authorized uh, in, in providing some services. Uh, the other side, the construction industry, <coughs> sorry, if you think about it like cement, wood, uh, um, any type of construction material has very low differentiation. Any type of cement will li likely do. A very low switching cost. You, you know, uh, builders can kind of work uh, their way around any type of um, changes, and so that makes it like very low bargaining power. So when there is a deal that needs to be negotiated on the supply side, there is very low bargaining power towards the uh, buyer side. Now the other side of the spectrum is the uh, buyer's bargaining power. Um, so this means basically like how much power your end uh, consumer customers have over your uh, product, like how much they are able to influence your supply, your margins, and so on, right? And so a few key factors here is like the importance of the volume. Like if uh, 
I have very few customers, uh, and so they represent the majority of my market, of my uh, output and my sales. They're going to have a very strong uh, impact on my ability to set uh, price. Uh, but if I have many customers, then I'm going to be able to uh, not care that much if one customer is not willing to pay a specific price. And so that's one way threat of backward integration is like, what is the chances of like this specific customers to come into my space and like kind of get rid of my of my input on their side. Um, and so some of the, you know, switching costs is always there. Um, buyers information, like how aware are they of potential um, alternatives, how much they are aware of like the actual cost they could pay uh, and so on. So some example here, food retail industry. So like big food distributor like Walmart, you know, have a high purchase volume over the supply side. They have very low switching costs. They can probably like, you know, change the type of suppliers from one side to another. And a lot of availability of alternatives, you can buy fruit and meat from different type of producers. So they have a very high bargaining power. Like seller wants to be in Walmart. So they have very strong. So Walmart has a very strong bargaining power over them. Of course, that doesn't always work. Like Coca-Cola, for example, has a very strong pull through from customers like customer wants to buy Coca-Cola. So Walmart would need to negotiate a different terms with Coca-Cola because if Coca-Cola pulls out of Walmart, Walmart will lose a material amount of customers. Uh, the opposite side is like small retail industry, like fashion boutiques. You know, if you can think of like a small shop uh, when they go and try to buy uh, products and items from like fashion manufacturer, they have very low purchase volume. Uh, so the, this products have very high impact on their ability to reach customers. They have very low market control, so they will be unable to um, deal to make like specific advantage, advantageous deal uh, with manufacturer. Uh, another um, force is the threat of substitute. So fourth force. So what are the chances that there is another product or service that is serve that is going to provide the same type of uh, output that your product does at a comparable price, right? So key factors here is basically like availability of substitutes. How much do they cost? Uh, do they perform at the same level? What are the switching costs? Uh, what is the willingness to, to switch, right? So industry where there is a high risk of substitutes offering like comparable or better performance at a lower or similar price have lower long-term profit margins, right? Because there is a higher chance that customers will just kind of jump from one to another. Uh, some example, um, Pfizer and the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry has very low sensitive to substitutes. So highly developed drugs are regulated. So it's unlikely that there is going to be something similar. Uh, they have very product, high product differentiation. So they will tackle different type of uh, problems. And there is fairly low willingness to substitutes because you're looking for a specific effect from a drug. And because of that, the threats of substitute is fairly low. Of course, we're not talking about like the very um, kind of over-the-counter uh, drugs, but uh, more of like highly and uh, research developed drugs. The taxi industry on the other side, uh, you, there is very low switching costs. Like you can move from one cap to another every day. Uh, you cap, of course, cap company. Um, you have comparable price, like they generally price very similarly. Performances are generally similar. You go from A to B. Product differentiation is low. Brand loyalty is low. So you're very high sensitive to substitutes. If there is another company coming in that offers like uh, taxi services, chances of like customers moving to them, it's high. If, of course, like the uh, price is comparable. Um, and then last one is the rivalry among existing competitors. So the idea here is to try to estimate like how competitive and strong might be the rivalry among existing players. Like how much are they going to try to fight for the same part of the market versus they're going to go ahead and look for different, um, either different markets or try to uh, look at different segments on the market. So one important element here is the growth rate of the market. Uh, the stronger the growth rate, the how much is it expanding, the lower the chances that players will start competing amongst each other versus like just go and try to focus on specific segments. Um, switching cost, like if a player has very high switching cost, then it's going to be hard for them to say, OK, I'm going to just move to another market. Right. So exit barriers and strategic stakes, like how important is this market to this player? And so if it becomes an existential threat, like if a market, uh, if a player is going to uh, kind of 
stop business if it loses that market it's going to fight very hard but if that specific player has another opportunity and can just move easily from one side to another it's not going to fight as hard uh, and and so that kind of plays into uh, understanding like how strong is competition and you know the stronger the competition it means like price wars advertising battles and you know need for continuous innovation investment in rd which eventually will erode your ability to to have profits and margins um so some example here like the fast food industry very strong rivalry right like so you have a high number of players uh from like global players to local chains low product diversity low switching cost ease of product comparison like it's very easy to just like compare like different products and see which one you want high volume and low margins so this means that like scale is very important so basically if you are a player in the fast food industry you're trying to get as much uh, as much of the market you can uh, to grow your profits because your margins are are small. But at the same time, you're going to have a hard time into differentiating yourself from other players. And so you're going to have to uh, very hardly fight over segments, uh, either through like price reduction, which will reduce your margins or like through a different type of brand identity and marketing uh, and so on. If you take like other industry, like electricity distribution, is very highly regulated. The uh, buyer to enter is very high. And once you're in, it's kind of like, un- you def- definitely don't have that same type of pressure from new players coming in. And so there is generally low rivalry through different entities in those uh, sector. Um, so now we're gonna try to look at this five forces that we analyzed. So again, threats of new entrants, uh, supplier bargaining powers, uh, buyer bargaining powers, uh, risk of alternative products and rivalry. And we're going to try to apply this concept to the U.S. mutual fund industry and understand like what are the key factors that drive competition and like profitability, as well as like how appealing might be to enter this sector. So just as a definition, a mutual fund is an investment fund that pulls money from like many investors to purchase securities. For securities, we mean like equities, bonds, commodities, real estate, or the financial instrument. And you know the customers on, on this industry are either large investors, like pension funds, or retail investors, like many small players, individual entities, right? And so that's the customer side. And the supply side instead is, for the most part, like financial data uh, and analysis services. So like what are the kind of... Uh, what's the material and services that the U.S. mutual fund has to purchase to operate. So they need like financial data, they need IT, uh, some human management, and of course, like legal and compliance services. So that's kind of the very rough level uh, and high level, the supply chain. So when we think about threats of new entrants, right, like then we can split into like what is problematic, like what is actually something that increases the threats of new entrants. And the things that comes to mind here is like technological advancement, so rise of fintech and you know different type of products like ETF, robo advisor, uh, user friendly investment platform like Robinhood, are probably like pulling oxygen and customers from the U.S. mutual fund sector. Uh, so someone might be more inter- so might might be interested into say like I'm just gonna buy an ETF instead of like a mutual fund, um, for different reasons that we look into. So that increases the threats of new entrants, right? Like, uh, entities that are going to come into the sector and kind of disrupt the the status quo. On the other side, on the beneficial, is you really need a lot of capital to enter this market. Uh, Your brand needs to be very strong to acquire customers. And there is a very strong uh, economy of scale and learning. Like, it's not that easy to understand what works and what not. And you need large scale to actually generate profits. You can't operate at a very local level. And so this reduced the threats of new entrants at the same time. Uh, and the supplier bargaining power, uh, it's very little problematic, in my opinion. Uh, you know, low threats of forward integration, like it's unlikely that someone that provides IT support or like, uh, you know, financial data is going to enter and start providing U.S. mutual, uh, mutual funds. Uh, and so there is low concentration as well. There is no single group that holds significant influence over mutual fund companies. Like, the services are purchased from different entities. The switching costs are not as high. Uh, so as a player in the mutual fund industry, you don't have uh, that much fear from suppliers uh, and also pull through from end customers. 
you know, some you can consider like the so from the supply side, the human management side, like so basically your employees. There are some brand manager fund managers that might be very attractive, but overall you don't have that much of a power in their hands. And on the buyer side, uh, you find a fairly similar uh, situation with a small exception. Uh, like there is very low differentiation among products. Uh, so that increases a little bit of the buyer power. Uh, but the information available for buyers is, despite uh, the amount being high, uh, very low in terms of like buyers being able to process those information and extract directional uh, inputs. Uh, and the switching cost for mutual for individual investors are not that high, but for institutional clients, uh, they're very high. So pension fund. And in both cases, there's a lot of research and transition and learning that are necessary to do that. So customers generally tend to stick around uh, when you pick mutual fund. Uh, and then, of course, like another thing that is important is like the cost of the product is fairly low. Like, if you think about a mutual fund, uh, a pension fund that is buying billions of dollars of securities, uh, the cost that a mutual fund, a mutual fund might charge them for is very minimal, and so you are not that interested into changing mutual fund for saving, you know, a small percentage of that already small um, cost compared to the, your total investment. Uh, threats of substitutes. We touched this already. It's probably one of the most problematic areas. There's a lot of substitutes coming out, you know, from ETF, uh, uh, CDs, edge funds, all type of, of products that offer similar performances at a comparable price, right? Uh, and again, like what probably is limiting the big shift from consumer side is the high switching cost uh, that are needed to kind of move from one product to another. Um, and of course, one, one thing that is also worth mentioning is like this type of forces variate also depending on other factors like economical and market trends. Like with in a market where interest rates are very high, then, you know, CDs becomes a much more appealing compared to mutual funds. Uh, but in a market with low interest, then that's not as appealing. So mutual funds becomes more appealing in their ability to generate profits and returns. Uh, so forces uh, are not... Uh, change and, and might vary depending on like the geopolitical, economical and market uh, conditions. Uh, lastly, the rivalry among existing competitors. So it's a lot of firms operating in this industry and each of them has very strategic stakes. It's very hard for a firm operating in the mutual fund to just change sectors and offer a different a product. So there's a very strong investment in staying into this market, which means they'll fight very hard uh, to to not be defeated. And on top of that um, is strong economy of scale, which means that players need and are looking to increase the market share so that they can increase profits uh, without increasing as much their cost because there's big scale. So big players will try to fight uh, to get much and more and more and more market share all the time. Um, the market is fairly mature, has a slow growth, which also intensify competition. Uh, products are fairly similar. Uh, you know, segmentation is you know split between institutional in, in segments and and like um, retail investment in the investors. And on the beneficial side, you know, you can think about brand importance. So firms like Vanguard and Fidelity have a strong brand recognition, which mitigate the rivalry to some extent because they don't need to fight that much. Uh, and also like the switching cost on the uh, consumer side makes it so that like fighting is not as productive because consumers will not change that easily. So uh, that kind of mitigate something that otherwise would be a much more intense um, aspect of the industry. So just to have a recap, right, we talk about five forces, uh, threats of new entrants, supplier bargaining powers, buyer powers, threats of substitutes and industry rivalry and how these forces can be used to understand how what are the dynamics and the powers that uh, regulate a specific market, in particularly with an eye of how competitive it is and what are the profit margins, both in the short term and the long term. Uh, and then we try to apply this concept to the mutual fund industry, uh, where we see that while mature and like fairly competitive, the mutual fund industry probably has still more, uh, it's more attractive 
than repellent from a um, profitability and 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 perspective. Uh, you know, key challenges here are probably like the ability to maintain a differentiated product between ETFs and other emerging uh, services. Um, so that was it. Uh, I hope you uh, found this useful and please let me know in any comments if there's a question, I'll be to follow up. Thank you all.